Hi, welcome back. In structural analysis, we use a concept known as determinacy to provide us information about a structure, and it lets us know if we have enough equations using either statics or basic mechanics materials principles at our disposal to be able to solve a particular problem. In this video, I'm going to show you how to do it. So without further ado, let's get started. All right, so if you remember back when we first started this series, and even all the classes you've taken up to this point, you know, whether it's statics or mechanics materials, at the end of the day, everything we did boiled down to these six equations. Now, for three dimensions, it was three forces, summation, some in the x, some in the y, and some in the z, and three moments, the moment about the x-axis, the moment about the y-axis, and the moment about the z-axis, and Isaac Newton said that for equilibrium to exist, all of those had to sum to zero. Any one of them did not sum to zero. You did not have equilibrium. Okay, so that gave us six equations that, you know, on this. So at the beginning of our study, every calculation or every structure there that we could analyze, we had to have at most six unknowns. Now, for two dimensions, remember it was just forces x, forces y, and the moment about the z-axis that we worked with, which only gave us three equations. So, so this was all we could solve. And then as you progress through your static studies and any of your mechanics material studies, we started finding ways to gain additional information or to gain additional calculations as we tried to look at. We did some redundant force methods and mechanics and materials. Um, for hinge and machine problems, we you know blew structures apart at the hinges and picked up some extra unknowns, but also picked up some extra equations. And, and we showed you some basic tactics on how to do this. What this topic is going to do is going to try to, it's kind of the in-between step, if you will. Determinacy, if we can do a calculation for determinacy, I can tell you, you know, how many equations you need to solve it. Is a structure solvable using classical structure, uh, statics methods, or do I need to do, you know, some more approximate method using, you know, computer software or, or whatnot? Okay, and I can also tell you whether or not a structure is stable, both internally and externally. And so that's the purpose of what it is that we're trying to do. So to kind of define a couple of concepts that we've picked up back in statics, okay, we define a structure as being determinant if all forces in a structure can be determined strictly from those six equilibrium equations. Okay, if I can, if I have enough equations to solve it, it's statically determinant. Okay, it's indeterminate if there are more unknown forces on a free body diagram than I have equations to work with. Okay, so very, very basic concept, but, you, but you'll hear us talk about you know, structural being, uh, being statically determinant or a structure being, that's indeterminate to, say, the second degree. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about what that actually means as we look in this. All right, so for simple two-dimensional structures, you know, a planar structure, maybe it's, you know, a beam or something, we're going to define determinacy then by an equation that is R equals 3 times N. Okay, N is the number of parts or members of the structure, and R is the number of forces and moment reactions, okay, that exist on the structure. These are the external supports, if you will. Okay, um, it's statically indeterminate if R is greater than that value. So we'll show you a couple of examples here as we start to move, move along. So that gives us the ability to determine if a structure is indeterminate. Now let's take a look at figuring out the degrees of indeterminacy. When we say something is two degrees indeterminate, what is it that we're actually saying? Okay, and so for us, we're going to de define the degrees of external indeterminacy by a variable known as I sub E. Okay, and then we're going to say that's equal to R minus three, where R is the number of external support reactions. So if I have five support reactions <coughs> on a particular structure, then I would be two degrees indeterminate. Okay, now, other information that we can pull out of this, this determinacy idea is that if R is less than 3, okay, it is statically unstable externally. And we'll show you some examples here in a second. Okay, if R is equal to 3, it's statically determinate. And if it's R is greater than 3, it's statically indeterminate. And it's only the indeterminate structures where I need to use this equation here. Okay, so um, other things that we can, we can conclude is um, we're going to define N as being the number of members. Okay. If R is less than 3N, it's unstable. If R is equal to 3N, it's statically determinate. 
and if r is greater than three n, it's static being determined. It's exactly the same thing. Different books write it different ways as we start to kind of look um, look like this. So what happens is is that you notice the difference between these equations is the presence of this n. Okay, so this is for one member. So maybe this is just a simply supported beam, and that's what I'm calculating. But if I get into structures such as frames and machines or things that are hinged together or can be blown apart, then I need to start taking into account the number of members. This was the trick that allowed us to analyze those frame and machine problems. We separated a structure at its hinges, and then that gave me a free body diagram with some forces on it, and another part of a free body diagram that connected to it with the, the internal hinges acting on it, and that, that now I had two structures, which now gave me six equations in a 2D problem to be able to work with, okay? So as we look at this, um, the, the, the idea is, is that there are different types of internal connections. So if I scroll down here just a little bit, so maybe I have a beam that is fixed, fixed, and hinged in the middle, then I could blow this apart at the hinge, and I would have a structure I could try to analyze. And then I could blow this apart at the hinge and start to analyze that. And that's how we start to kind of separate this and gain more equations. Now, for very complex systems, we can get into large numbers of free body diagrams and, and equations to be able to solve, and it becomes very not impossible, but it's just not an easy chore to be able to calculate all of those, all right? Now, so this is what we call as an internal hinge. And if you remember, an internal hinge had a vertical and a horizontal acting on each side of the hinge. So if I come in and draw this guy, I had one here and one here, and then on the other side, I had the opposite. Okay, now, if you're struggling with how we how we handle handle these, take a look at our um, our statics lessons on frames and machines, and we'll explain this because you now this is for two members coming together. You also can do the same thing for three members coming together, and that's where it gets a little bit more complex. Okay, but the thing to remember is is that this hinge had two unknowns on either side. So that's and so these internal hinges uh, give us an additional two reactions to work with. Okay, and but the thing that helps us out is is that these two show up on this structure, but they also show up on this structure. Okay, and so they're the same two unknowns for two members coming together. Okay, now you can also have internal um, internal rollers. Those will be some sort of slot, uh, a, a slotted connection. So if I have, you know, maybe, and there's my slot, and then this guy is coming like this, where this would be a pin that connects the two, but the pin is free to move left and right. Then the free body diagram that exists on this would look something like this, and then the one on the other side would look something kind of like that. It's free to move. There's no resistance, so that would just be a one degree. So you have to understand what's going on. Now, most of the problems we work in this series will be dealing with internal hinges where you have two, but if you have an internal roller or an internal slot or something, understanding the behavior, that one's only worth one. Okay, all right, so that's what we're going to kind of look at. So let's take a look at a couple of these and see what we can do as far as the calculations go. Okay, so we'll start with the first one, number one here, and basically all we're doing is we're coming in and we're figuring out what's our R and what's our N. Okay, so this is clearly one beam, so our N is one, and we have a bunch of reactions. So I've got three at this location, one for the roller, one for the roller, or five total. Okay, and so if we look, our R is five, that's three plus one plus one, our N is one, or we can just jump up and use the N equals one case, that's what this was, N equals one. No, for that scenario. And so we can see that we have five unknowns. So this is indeterminate because five is greater than three. And that puts us down in this case, it's statically indeterminate externally. And so when I know that it's indeterminate, I can now calculate the degrees of indeterminacy. So this would be IE is equal to R minus three. It's going to be equal to five minus three. It's two degrees indeterminate. Okay. And so what that means is that I have to, that statics alone will not solve this problem. I have to come up with some other approaches and back in mechanics materials, we showed you some of those. One of the redundant force methods was I could reduce, remove these two guys, allow the beam to deflect under the load and then calculate the load that it would take to push this thing back up. Okay. And the more degrees of indeterminacy you have, the more unknowns you have to, to pull off of the system and then more coupled equations, if you will, if you remember doing all that kind of stuff. So, so that's kind of a, a very simple, quick example of what it is that we're trying to do. Okay, now let's go back to our hinge example. Take a second and see if you can figure out how many unknowns are working on this. Okay, so what's your end? In this case, it should be two because I can blow it apart at the hinge, right? Okay, and your R then is how many? I've got three on a fixed, three on a fixed, and two internal, so that should be an eight. 
Okay, so if we look, so we have six external plus the two internals from the hand, just gives us eight total as our R value. Okay, and so then R is equal to three. Here's my N of two, because there are two members. It says that six is less than eight, so we have two degrees of indeterminacy. Even on this structure, even if I blew it apart, it's still two degrees indeterminate. It's just, a, okay. All right, how about this one? Okay. And so if we look, now I've got a cantilever beam. It's fixed at this end. I have a roller. This is kind of like an internal roller that I just showed you. Or it could be an external roller, this kind of structure, and then an external roller over here. And so we would go through and we would calculate what our structure looks like. Now, this kind of looks a little wonky, right? You've got a cantilever beam with a skateboard on top of it. Kind of gives you the idea that maybe it's not a stable situation, okay? And we'll prove that that's indeed the case. So what is your R? Okay, so I've got three here plus one here, plus the one internal. Okay, so that's gonna be our, so my re external reactions is four, three here and one here, and then I pick up one, I'll put an equal sign on that, one for the internal hinge, or the uh, what I'm calling is an internal hinge on this. Okay, it gives us a value of five. Okay, what's our N? Okay, our N value here is two. So we've got two of these. So if we do go back to our comparison, three R, how does that compare to three times N? Well, clearly, Three times two is six again, okay? And that's greater than five. This is an unstable external structure, right? And that makes sense, right? If something hit this beam on top and there's nothing that allowed it to stop, then this thing would just take off and it's unstable, okay? And the structure, you know, summing forces in the X direction on this, if there's any X force on it, this thing will, will start to move, okay? And that's kind of the approach that we're looking at doing on all of this, all right? So, so and we can do this for lots more. Let's try another one, okay? Try the next one. Okay, so now we've got a multi-part, uh, multi-span kind of structure. Okay, I've got an internal hinge and an internal hinge. What's your R? Well, pin support, that's two. Roller one, roller one, roller one. That gets me five external supports. And then internals, I've got two hinges at two apiece, so we should be sitting at nine. So five external, four internal gets, gives me nine total. And that seems like a lot of stuff that you have to deal with, okay? How many members do we have? If you look, I got one here. I got the one from hinge to hinge. That's two, and another one from here. So even though this structure is very, very big, R is equal to three times three is nine. That's equal to my nine here. This is statically determinate. So you can tell by looking at this structure, you know, can I solve it? You know, is it a solvable situation, or do I need to be looking to do other, other tricks? And that's the power of what determinacy is doing for us. Okay, it also gives us an idea of this idea of stability. And in this case, we're a stable structure because we're, you know, we're equal to the number for uh, static being statically determinate. Okay, or static, another way to say it is statically determinate is zero degrees indeterminate, and that's a good thing for us. Okay, now, so we did some beams. Now let's go try, see if it does anything differently for, say, a frame. Okay, so we've got this kind of gable end with a hinge in the middle. Okay, and it's pinned at the bottom and pinned at the bottom here. And we try to figure out, well, what's our state? So our R's, we have two here and two here. That's four plus an internal hinge is another two. So that should give us six. And then when I plug those in, we have two members. So three times two is six. And that's equal to the six that I have. So this guy is also statically determined. You would blow it apart at the hinge and have enough information to be able to solve it. And these are the type of problems that you solve back in your statics class more than likely. Okay, all right. All right, how about this one? This one's kind of interesting. Okay, and in fact, this is the basis for an approximate analysis method that you'll learn later on in the series, known as the portal method, okay, or even the lateral force method, or, or cantilever method. There's a lot of different techniques that use this idea, Let's hinges in the middle of everything. So I have fixed, fixed at the bottom, and fixed here at the bottom, and then I have three hinges acting on us there. So what do we have? We have, you know, so if I didn't have the hinges on this, you would have six unknowns, this would be three degrees statically indeterminate, but putting in these hinges, and there are rules and assumptions on where I can put these when I do my analysis is one of the techniques on there. You know, if I didn't have the hinges on three degrees indeterminate, but if I put the hinges in on here, take a look what happens. I've got three external, three external is six. I've got a hinge, a hinge, and a hinge. So I've got three hinges, which are two internals, gives us six, so now we're looking at 12. Okay, and that's all there is to it. Now, how many members did we break this thing into? So one, two, three, four members, okay? And so three times four is 12, and that's equal to 12. This guy is actually statically determinate. 
So by knowing where to locate these hinges, and again, I didn't even make any rule, uh, you know, assessment of location of, of where those hinges are. We just put hinges in on there. And I took a structure that was three degrees indeterminate, and all of a sudden now I can break it apart and solve it using just the basic equations of statics. That's the heart of some of these approximate methods that we'll learn here um, in the coming in the coming weeks on these videos on those kind of things. So it's pretty cool. It's kind of kind of a neat idea. All right, so pretty pretty easy, pretty basic. All right. Okay, so let's take a look at some equations of condition. Let's try this one. Okay, so if we look now, I've got and I know it's not real clear. There's a hinge here. I've got a pin here. And then I've got a roller over at the other side happening there. This is my kind of my inline roller skate, multi-wheel kind of roller. Okay, and I put forces on this structure. What do we know about this structure? Is it determinant, indeterminate, or stable? Now, clearly, if this guy's on wheels and I start pushing on it, this thing's just going to open up. We know that it's unstable. But we can put the equations on it and test it and, and verify our assumption on this, okay? And it's not stable because of the presence of the hinge. Because what happens is the number of externals is R. That's going to be my three. I have the two for the hinge gives me five. Okay. And then I have two members that I broke this into. So five is less than three times two is equal to six. This is an unstable structure because five is less than six, which is what's needed for equilibrium. Now imagine if you took that hinge out of this structure. Now what is it? Well, that two goes away. Now I'm at R is equal to three external. Gives us five or sorry, it gives us three, okay, and then three is less than one times three, or is equal to one times three, so this would be a statically determinate structure if I didn't have the hinge. So we gotta be careful about putting hinges into things because it can give us to an unstable situation as we start to kind of look at that. All right, so what we're looking at then is kind of the idea, to, to re-summarize is that the number of reactions, and this is for you know a 2D planar structure, is less than three plus EC, okay, where EC is the number of degrees of indeterminacy, that if R is less than that number, then structure is statically unstable, okay, if it's equal to that quantity, it's determinate, and if it's greater than that quantity, it's indeterminate, and that's kind of what it, all of this boils down to as we start to kind of look at it. Okay, now, what changes if we look at the structure in, say, three dimensions? Well, the only thing that's going to happen is that three right there becomes a six, okay, so if I have two three-dimensional members, then I have to count up all the reactions. I count up the hinges. Your hinges may be, may not be two anymore. They may be three. It becomes a little bit more complex, but the same idea for determinacy starts to work. And we can start to kind of figure these things out. A lot of software packages will do this check up front, and then they will report back that, oh, a structure is unstable in a certain direction or unstable in a certain plane. Okay, and those will all be warnings that will, um, that, you know, when we get to working with STAT or any of our software analysis, that we'll, I'll, I'll show you those as well. But a lot of professional packages actually do this calculation behind the scene to be able to figure out if you can solve it. Because part of the problem you have is when you go to solve these things with the computer software, there are a series of matrices that show up, and you can get in, you know, a structure that's, you know, that you're not able, that's singular, that you're not able to invert the stiffness matrix for, uh, for those kind of things. And that's one of the mathematical problems that this will help you identify that you're going to have. Okay, and that's the power of what it is that we're trying to do. Okay, all right, let's take a look at what happens with trusses. Trusses are a little bit different. Okay, and I got a real quick example here. Okay, that for trusses, all we're doing is now we're looking at, because trusses have a certain behavior in which we're pinned at the ends, okay, and they have the strict definitions that they connect pins, and then so this would have, you know, we'd be looking at, you know, a B plus an R. B is the number of members. R is the number of reactions. Okay, and then two times N, where N is the number of joints. Is the, is the equation that we'll be using on this one. So if we kind of take a look at a simple, you know, simply supported truss that looks something on kind of like this, the number of members that we have, we have one, two, three, four, five, that's my B. I have reactions, those are the external support reactions just like we did before. I have two here, one here, that gets me three, okay? And so, you know, five plus three would be um, equal to eight, clearly. And then we're gonna compare that to the number of joints. So if we're equal to this, it's statically determinate. If we're less, we're, in we're unstable. And if we're greater than, we're indeterminate. Okay, and so the number of joints that I have is one, two, three, four, and this is two. So because there are two unknowns at every internal, it's kind of like the hinge problem that we just solved, if we look at it. 
Um, and so n is equal to 4, and so in this case, 8 is equal to 8. That tells us that this is a structurally de determinate truss system. Okay. Let's go through and let's look at something a little more, uh, more complex. Maybe this is a compound truss. Okay. So there's a hinge here. It looks like a blob, a big hinge there. And so this would be a cantilever truss with another truss hanging off of it. Okay. And so play the same game. How many members do we have? We go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So there are 14 members. Uh, we have how many support reactions? I've got two on the pin, one on the roller, one on the roller. That gets me four. And then how many joints does this structure have? So there's one here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 on those. And so 14 plus 4 is equal to 2 times 9. 18 is 18, statically determinate. All right, let's try another one. What about just a simple structure? Let's toss this one down here real quick, just to kind of illustrate. And now we have a truss that does this. Okay. If we kind of look at a system that looks kind of like that. Now, I do want to point out that this, that we're not going to connect that point there. Okay? So if we do that, then what's your B? Okay, B is the number of members. One, two, three, four, five, six. We would have six. R, in this case, is two plus one. equals three, like something kind of like that. Okay, and then my N is the number of joints. In this case, we have four. Okay, would tell me that this is then six plus three is gonna be, how does that relate to two times four? Tells me that this is nine is greater than, ah, I keep breaking my leg here, sorry about that. Nine times eight, okay, so this is indeterminate. Okay, and if I do 9 minus 8 equals 1 degree, so it's 1 degree indeterminate, all because of the presence of that extra diagonal. Okay, now if I took that extra diagonal off, what would you have? Well, what would change in this? The only thing that would change would that this would become a 5 on here, right? And so then we would have 5 plus 3 is 8, equal to 2 times 4, statically determined. So one of the techniques for solving trusses, if you remember from your mechanics and materials, was we would cut one of these, allow it to deform and do our deflection calculation using virtual work and mechanics. And I'll show you again in this series, we'll come back around to that again. And then you figure out what the internal force is required to close up that gap, okay? It becomes a deformation related problem on those, okay? So that's kind of an interesting thing. One, one tip off on this is that what happens if all of a sudden I, I went in and took the same structure and I hinged it in the middle? Okay, same structure, but now I pin those things together. Okay, so it says that it's a pin. So now my B on this one is number of members. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight members. Okay, my R is still three. Okay, and what's your N in this case? So one, two, three, four, five. With well, something kind of like this. Make sure I counted those right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight members. Okay, so that gives us eight plus three. How does that compare to two times five? Okay, this gives us an 11. Okay, which is now gonna be greater than two times five is 10. Okay, so again, we're back to 11 minus 10. It's still one degree indeterminate. Let's just start to kind of kind of look at those. So anyway, that's kind of the approach of what we have happening. So this is kind of it's kind of an interesting approach. Right? Oops, didn't realize I was off the paper. So eight plus three gives us eleven greater than uh, two times five. So that's one degree indeterminate. What happens if I remove this guy from the picture and I start to analyze it now? Well, what changes? This guy goes to seven. Seven plus three. All of a sudden, if I take this member out of the bottom of this thing. Okay, then now it becomes statically determinate because you'll be able to find the support reactions and then once I have those, I can start to find everything else 
as we start to kind of look at, you actually start finding a lot of zeros and zero force members, and I'll show you that in a couple of videos coming up as well. Okay, but anyway, that's kind of the idea of what it is that we can do with indeterminacy. So, determinacy is very, very important to us in structures, but it's not everything. And just for a structure to be statically determinate does not necessarily mean that it's stable. Okay, and so this is why we had that stability check in the last methodology. And I'm going to show you a couple of test cases that if you can identify scenarios that look, you know, such as the ones I'm getting ready to show you, you can quickly conclude it's stable or it's unstable, so forth and so on. Because even though structures are statically determinate, okay, we still have this, this whole issue of stability. Okay, so the first one I'm going to show you is known as the parallel force instability. So what I have is I have kind of a rigid beam that's connected this way. Okay, and it has a roller, a roller, a pin, and then it's aligned vertically such that I have a pin support here. So there's kind of a linkage, if you will. And the, the key to recognize here is that that guy is zero. Okay, now if I didn't have this, this would be statically indeterminate to one degree, all right? And it would be stable because I would have four unknowns that the horizontal reaction here would be able to fight that Q force. So I have a vertical force P and a horizontal force Q. But by doing this linkage assembly such that it's vertical and driving this guy to zero, now it becomes indeterminate, okay? Because if I sum forces in the x direction on the whole system, if you will, because of the presence of this link and the fact I removed the two moments on this thing, sum of forces in the x direction is only zero if Q is zero, okay? If Q is not zero, this thing, what's going to happen is it's going to deform some amount, and then this linkage what was a force acting up the link is now going to be inclined along the direction of the link. And now once it deforms, there's an X component of this guy that will balance this. All right. So that's why it doesn't matter the weight or the load or the size of all your forces are parallel. You can move this thing a little bit and then eventually it will start to fight back. Okay. So basically um, this is the before case where we're statically unstable. And then once it deforms, then we're, um, we're able to uh, achieve uh, uh, stability after the displacement because of that horizontal force that shows up. So that's the first one. It's called the parallel force instability. Okay, the next one that we have is called a concurrent force instability. And what that is, is it's an instability that develops because all of your support reactions pass through a singular point. So I've got kind of a kind of an interesting example here that it's a beam. It's on a roller that is vertical. So this is my reaction for the roller. Okay, and then it's pinned at the other end. Well, you know, statically determinant wise, it's determinant, right? AX, AY, and BX, it would be statically determined. I can find everything. We would prove that it's not stable, but we could be able to, to kind of start to solve this. So that's the case. Now, a concurrent force instability occurs um, because the, the restraints are uh, positioned uh, to prevent a system um, from having an unstable uh, rotation, which is what's happening here. Okay, now for equilibrium and for stability, sum of moments equals zero must be satisfied. So assuming that P is at some distance of A, and A is not a zero value, if I write the sum of moments, say, about this point here, what do I get? I get P times A better be equal to zero. Okay, so what are your options? Well, one is, is that the load, um, and the load has to be zero, so this is the equation that we have, is that either the load is zero or little a and little a is the dimension here well what is what does it mean if little a is zero well then this guy is directly over the support and then it's back to being a stable structure okay so for this particular example assuming that p is not equal to zero on there and then a is not equal to zero this would be a what we call a concurrent force instability okay and so this one can get and sneak up on you from time to time as well okay what about this guy Okay, so again, this is another example of that concurrent force instability. I have a pin structure, okay, and then I have a roller at an angle such that there's a reaction that if this line of action points down through here, even though I have these two guys acting in completely opposite directions and we've got this eccentricity on here, okay, if this is the, you know, this would be considered as an unstable structure since all forces are concurrent. Again, this is a roller. It kind of looks like a pin. That's a pretty lousy picture, and I apologize. Okay, so we have kind of a kind of a pin support 
or a roller support there and a fin support here. So we have three unknowns, and it's that same idea that if I came and put a load out here somewhere at some non-A a equal to zero distance, or not equal to zero, I guess, if I call that as A, if we look at that, then this would be also part of this concurrent force system that we were talking about. So it doesn't have to be something that's kind of trivial like this. It can be something a little bit more complex, you know. Um, and that's one of the checks that we can do. So we're always kind of keeping our eyes open for, for these, 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 these concurrent systems and these parallel systems um, as, as far as instability goes. So anyway, lots of little, little shortcuts and things. We didn't do any major you know, structural analysis, we didn't solve really any statics problems. We applied some basic principles here, but that was the, this video, what's happening is, is that we're trying to look at a structure as a whole to determine what can we find out you know, up to this point, as always, you can find it, you can solve it. We showed you the tricks back in statics and mechanics and materials. But now we're looking to see, structurally, do we have some problems? And these are some very simple but powerful techniques and concepts in determinacy and these, these um, instability definitions as we start to kind of look at them. Now, there are some other, there are others that will pop up from time to time, but these are the, the most classics and the easiest ones to recognize right off the bat. So... Um, I hope it's made sense. Um, as always, if you've got any questions, leave us a, a, some feedback down below, and we'll be happy to try to address any issues that you have. And otherwise, make sure you like and subscribe to the channel, and we would greatly appreciate it. Um, have a great afternoon. Happy engineering.